this interview with Senator Tom Harkin for the Robert J. Dole Institute of Politics at the University of Kansas. We're in the Senator's Washington office. Today is January 30th, 2008, and I'm Brian Williams. Let's start, Senator. Uh, I know you and Senator Dole uh, worked together on the ADA um, Act. And can you tell me a little bit about how that came to be and why 1990 was the appropriate time for passage of such a, an act? I guess all the stars got aligned or something like that. But uh, I had been involved in disability work since I first came to Congress. My brother is disabled. And uh, most of my early work in the House had to do with uh, deafness, because uh, my brother was deaf. Then when I, uh, just about the time I came to the Senate in 1984, I'd begun working on broader aspects. Uh, we had done the idea of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act when I was in the House. Uh, and then I came to the Senate and, um, and uh, 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 Lowell Weicker at that time uh, was the chairman of the Appropriations Committee on, uh, on uh, education, health, that type of thing. And uh, also, I then got on the committee that uh, uh, was the Education Committee. And uh, at that time, the sort of the germination of the Americans with Disabilities Act was just starting. Lil Weicker was the first sponsor of it. Senator Dole was a co-sponsor of it, as I was and others. Uh, and that sort of rolled around for a couple of years. And then in 19, uh, now see when I got here, Senator Dole was a majority leader. So I've been 85, 86. Then the Democrats took control of the Senate back in 87. Uh, and then uh, uh, I found myself then as the chairman of the Disability Policy Subcommittee uh, under Senator Kennedy. As well, in, then two years after as chairman of the Appropriations Subcommittee, because Lowell Weicker then lost in uh, I think 88, his re-election. Uh, and so I sort of took that over at that time. Uh, all through all this, uh, Senator Dole was always uh, very uh, keen, very active in this uh, in this area of disability policy. And then everything just sort of come, came together in 89 and uh, 90 after many years of working on it. Disability groups who had before been uh, 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 disagreeing on what should be in a in an ADA bill, and, and from what we first started, what we wound up there was obviously we had to peel off some things, which maybe disturbed one group, made another group happy, that kind of thing. So it was very tough keeping all the disability groups sort of together. Uh, but that finally happened. Uh, I can remember some long meetings and. I can remember putting disability groups in a room and saying, uh, okay, when you come out of here, I want an agreement. And shut the door and stay in here until you get some agreement. Uh, and so that all happened. And then 89, it came together, uh, finally with 90, with the passage of it, of the American Disabilities Act. Was your brother following this closely? Oh, sure. Sure. He was what was first. his reaction when, when it passed? Well, I, I think, you know, he, he, happy, but I mean, he was more happy about some other things. Well, he was happy about the uh, fact that we now were getting closed captioning on television. Because uh, other than his deafness, he had absolutely no other disability whatsoever. So he was more interested in communications and, and uh, uh, telephones and how you communicate on telephones and TTYs, and uh, that was more of his interest. He was happy about ADA, but. And I think like a lot of people with disabilities, they want to know what to do for me. Well, we'd already done the National Captioning Institute. Uh, we'd already had uh, 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 decoders. Uh, uh, shortly after that, in 93, I think it was 93, we passed, I think, the telecommunications bill uh, that set up, that mandated nationwide that um, operators that would operate TTYs, like if I called an operator and said, I want to call my brother and he's deaf, here's his TTY number, she would get on a TTY and I could speak to her, she would put on a TTY and would go to my brother, he would go back to her and she would tell me what he said. 
So obviously he was very interested in all that. Uh, I just want to add one thing. Uh, uh, um, uh, Senator Dole always was sort of behind the scenes in all this. Uh, well, as majority leader, and then as minority leader uh, uh, after 1987. Um, and uh, so this would have been, let's see, in 19... 89. No. Well, I'll have to think about this. Either late 89 or early 90. When uh, Senator Dole had a key meeting in this office. It was after a meeting I'd had at the White House, a chance meeting I had at the White House with President, then President Bush. And uh, uh, I can go into that if you want, but that's not part of it. What happened was Senator Dole called a meeting in his office over in the Capitol. Uh, and the reason it was called is because I had said to then President Bush that we've got a problem in the Americans with Disabilities Act. And I told him what it was, and he appointed uh, Boyden Gray and said, and I was there when he told Boyden Gray, now Boyden, I want this book, get, you know, get this thing done. Because one of the biggest stumbling blocks to getting the ADA passed was one John Sununu, who at that time, I believe, was Bush's chief of staff, if I'm not mistaken. And so Boyden Gray took on this job and with Dole, and they worked it out, and we had a meeting. And it was a very carefully crafted meeting in Senator Dole's Capitol office. Uh, there was Senator Dole, Governor Sununu, John Sununu, uh, Secretary Skinner of Transportation, who was pro-ADA, uh, Dick Thornburg, Attorney General, again pro-ADA, uh, Senator Dole, of course, Senator Kennedy, me. I don't know if I'm missing somebody. I, I think uh, I think there may have been somebody else in that meeting. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, maybe I can't remember. But that was the, the key players there. And the idea was to hammer out this agreement. So, oh, Senator Hatch was there. I know. Senator Hatch was also in on the meeting. It was to hammer out this agreement. And. The way it was set up was that Sununu had all these objections, but Skinner and Thornburg were on the other side. <laughs> I think there was one other person from the administration. I can't remember. Evan Kemp. Oh, Evan Kemp was there. Evan Kemp. He was the head of the EEOC. Was also at that meeting, uh, and he had gone now. But it was a person of, 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 of that had a disability and a very strong Republican, I might add, at that time. So we had all those people there. And so when Sununu was raising all these objections, they were on the other side. And so uh, I won't go into all the things of that meeting, but it was a very, uh, how can I say, uh, uh, voices got uh, uh, raised at the meeting. <laughs> and, uh, um, and, uh, and uh, it was Senator Dole who basically got everything calmed down and who uh, made the declaration there because it was his office. Uh, he was minority leader and siding with the administration people that were on our side, sort of isolated Sununu. And um, we said, okay, now there's what we agree on. We're going ahead even, and Sununu, what could he say? I mean, he had all the other administration people on the other side. And I thought it was I thought it was a pretty brilliant move, uh, and it, literally a few days after that we had our agreement. We moved ahead on that, so I remember that meeting very well. Uh, keep in mind that when Senator Dole first came to the Senate, sixty-eight, uh, uh, nineteen sixty-eight. You know, every senator gives their first speech on the floor of the Senate. Not so much anymore, but in those days they did. And the speech he gave was on disability policy. And what we need to do to change some of our systems to enable people with disabilities to work and that kind of thing. So he was kind of ahead of his time. 
And did you feel he revisited that issue on a periodic basis over the years? Oh, sure. Oh, yeah. In fact, haven't I heard that he gave a speech on the floor each April 14th, which was the anniversary of the day he right. was wounded? That's right, exactly. He always gave a speech on the floor and talked about disability policy. Yeah. So with your um, strong feelings about disability, um, you felt a comradeship with uh, Dole on that particular issue, I would think. Well, it's interesting. I did. Because I was chairman. It was my bill. My name was on it and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, and it's really interesting because this is, you're talking about 1990, 1989-90. Well, I came to the Senate in 1985. I was on the Agriculture Committee. I represented an agriculture state like Senator Dole did. He is the majority leader and there were, it was a very tough time in the Midwest in agriculture. Farmers were losing their farms, committing suicide. It was just a very tough time. One of those, I remember, I just remember it very well. And we had an 85 farm bill that we were working on. And of course, I was trying to get certain things in the farm bill uh, that were opposed by the administration. And uh, Senator Dole was the majority leader of the Senate, and we had the farm bill on the floor. And uh, I know that I got under his skin a lot. And uh, uh, there was a period of time there where uh, Senator Dole and I were uh, uh, bumping heads. I mean, very strongly. And I think there were times when Senator Dole wished I'd never, ever showed up in the United States Senate. <laughs> But that's, that's the way things are, you know? And so there was a period of time there where um, I never got along with Senator Dole. Uh, I thought he was ignoring the crisis in rural America and that type of thing. And of course, now that I've had the, had the uh, privilege of being here a long time, now being chairman of the Agriculture Committee, I can understand the pressures that are on someone like him uh, and that Sometimes you can't always do what you want to do. You have to take care of other people and stuff. Of course, when you're a freshman senator, you don't have to worry about things like that. Uh, so uh, there was, uh, I'd say, 85, 86, 87 in those years. Uh, uh, we, uh, we bumped heads a lot. Was there a time after that where you began to work more easily together? Yeah, I mean, yes, that's true. Um, um, and um, Dole sort of won me over one time because, uh, and we were, let me tell you, think, think, we didn't speak very much. Of course, he was a big leader. I was just a freshman. And, uh, and I was a rather cantankerous freshman, to tell you the truth, because I, I, I was sort of representing sort of what I was hearing in my own state with people going under, and you can imagine. Uh, how that presented itself to me, and I was just, I think, probably voicing those frustrations. Um, but there was a time, it was, Reagan was leaving office, and now that would be uh, 80, uh, 80, uh, 88. Uh, in 1988, I had had an, it was, uh, let me think about this a second, it was, uh, Yes, it was in 1987. It was Christmas. And the Reagan administration wanted something, it was an ambassadorship, somebody that they wanted to appoint, and it was, I think it was right around December 23rd, and everybody wanted to get out of here, but I had something that I felt that I had been violated, that the agreement had been violated, and it had to do with a, a railroad in Iowa. I don't need to go into all the aspects, something to do with the railroad and transportation thing that I felt that I had been stiffed on. And I wasn't going to let it go until they fixed my problem. And Senator Byrd then was our majority leader. And I was here, and he said you could go home. He would protect me, because I wasn't going to let anything happen on the floor until my problem was fixed. So I went home, and I remember about midnight I get a call. Can I let this thing go? And I said, no. So Senator Byrd, being the majority leader, protecting me. Then later on, I got a call from Reagan's person down in the White House. Who was his Secretary of State at that time? Must have been uh, Baker, James Baker. 
And uh, I kind of know him, nice guy, very nice guy. Called me up, Tom, we gotta have this guy get this done. I said, I'm sorry, I got stiff. I'm in a bargaining mood right now, and I'm not gonna let this thing go. Well, we have to have it. I said, no, I'm sorry. Well, fine. it was literally about 2 a.m. in the morning on December the 23rd, and I get a call, and it's the White House, must have been, was it Deaver, I think, at that time, and, and Bird and Dole <laughs> got me on the phone and said, you know, Bird was protecting me, and I said, no, if I have to, I'll get in my car and come back in there. But I'm not going to let go. And so finally, an agreement was reached that the White House would fix my problem in the next year if I let it go. I said, got your word, fine with me, let it go. So that was the last thing done before we went home for Christmas. And uh, so the next spring passes, now we're into 1988, and that fall. And because of a quirk in the way we did legislation that year, my problem was not fixed by Reagan. It wasn't fixed. So now we fast forward into the next year, so now we're into 89, and now Bush is president. Here comes the bill, the thing with my railroad thing in it. And uh, I said at that time, I said, well, okay, let's get it fixed. Well, the response from the White House was, we had no deal with you, that was Reagan. I said, wait a minute, uh-uh, I had the commitment of the administration and that should pass on, no? Uh, so I went and saw Bob Dole. And I said to Dole, I said, you know, remember that thing that a year ago we had that agreement? And I wrote, oh yeah, I, said, I remember that. And I said, well, I thought we had an agreement, the administration would take care of it and fix it. Yeah, he remembered that. I said, well, now they're saying they don't have to because that was Reagan and not them. And I said, that, that, that's not right. Well, he said, you're right. Let me, let me see what I, let me, let me see what I can do. And he left the floor, came back, and basically what he told the administration, a deal is a deal. I made that deal, Bird made that deal, the administration made that deal, and you gotta fix it. And they did. So my esteem for Bob Dole went up about a thousand percent. I said, now there's a man that keeps his word. And so I think my relationship with Dole after that got real good. <laughs> and I mean it. And uh, I kind of saw him in a different light. And uh, from then on, I've had just the best relationships with him. You came into uh, Congress in 1974 as part of that class of 74. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right well, after Watergate. Watergate class, right. And then you entered the Senate um, after uh, uh, Reagan's first term, mm -hmm. where things were a little bumpy economically and otherwise, mm -hmm. and that was the changeover. For the Democrats went back into the majority in 80. Well, no, uh, the Democrats went the majority in the Senate in 86. Right. right. Now, the House had never lost the majority. Right. right. The Senate went Republican in 81, and then in 86 it went back to the Democrats. Right, right. And then in 94 it went back again. Sure. Right, right. Um, those were different times, certainly 74 from today. Sure was. Um, can you kind of look back on that 74 through 96, which was when Dole left, and sort of think about what changes might have occurred in terms of, of Congress over that period? Did you sense differences? Oh, sure. A lot of differences. It's not, uh, we don't have the working relationships that we used to around here. Um, uh, we just, and quite frankly, I don't think we have the kind of leadership. Quite frankly, I'm not going to say one side or the other, but I'm just saying I don't think we have the kind of leadership we had in those days. And because of the money chase, everybody's out chasing money all the time. And we don't get a lot done around here. I mean, you, you, you do your job, you know, you do your committee work and stuff, then you're out chasing money, raising money for your campaigns constantly. Uh, when I first got here, even in the House, more in the Senate, when I came even in 85, I mean, we would get together as senators. Republicans and Democrats, we'd get together for this and that. And, uh, 
I remember later on, perhaps in my relationships with Dole got better, <laughs> that uh, we'd have things in his office. Uh, you know, just get togethers, maybe over a drink, talk about things off the record, no press, just talk about things, just jokes and things like that. But there was more of a sense of camaraderie there uh, than there is today and comedy. Um, uh, I'll, tell you, I, I had, I, I'll tell you this now. Um, I had a Republican tell me just not too long ago, said to me, uh, Okay, last year we had 62 filibusters in the Senate this, in, in, in 2007. And that, we've never had anything like that. And we have one senator, that, one senator that has a hold on like 90 bills. And uh, so I was mentioned, I was just talking to one of my friends on the Republican side about this. And I said, my, why is it that one or two, three senators on the Republican side can stop everything? It's just not right. And this senator, who was a high-ranking Republican, said to me, well, you know, if Dole were in charge, he wouldn't let anything like this happen. This would not happen under a Dole. And I said, well, I remember. That's right. That's probably true. Um, I mean, he, he knew what it took to operate the Senate and to move things and get the Republican input, slow things down if they have to. But he was not into that kind of gamesmanship and stuff. And right now, it seems to me the leadership of the Republican side is sort of saying, well, go ahead and do it. To, you know, individuals, you want to hold, put a hold on 90 bills? Go right ahead and do it. I, Dole would never have allowed that to, to happen. Mm -hmm. And that and that kind of breaks down working relationships. It kind of frustrates the will of the Senate, that kind of thing. Uh, do you think um, things can return to a, more like they used to be, or are conditions just so different that it's never going to happen? Well, I don't know. Uh, I hope I hope we can get back to a, a better working relationship in the Senate. Um, uh, but we're going to have to do something about this campaign financing and stuff. It's just out of hand. Um, and uh, there's going to have to be some agreements on some level here that neither side is going to be permitted to do what's happened here with 62 filibusters and one senator putting a hold on 90 bills and it, something's got to be done to say no neither side's going to do that and get back to a more reasonable way of, of bringing legislation up and letting senators I mean you know when I got here we'd bring up bills and they were open for amendment but no one abused it I mean if you tried to abuse it, your leader would knock you down and say, no. What's your most important amendment? You've got 10 amendments. What's your two or three most important? Okay, you get those. And woe to you if you didn't follow the leadership. But they would be reasonable about that. No, we've got people out here offer 20, 30 amendments. It's unreasonable. And filibusters in those days were utilized only for the most important pieces of legislation that were that really had let's say a, a big minority that might be opposed to it I, I remember the natural gas bill for example long filibuster the majority was on in favor of it but there was a sizable minority that felt that they weren't getting their fair share yeah you'd have filibusters on stuff like that I was surprised in doing research about uh, some of your uh, views that you had supported the balanced budget amendment. And do you think fiscal responsibility is also a big problem these days? Sure. As we speak now, making this, we have a so-called stimulus bill on the Senate floor, or uh, coming to the Senate floor tomorrow, tonight or tomorrow. And quite frankly, I just, I mean, <laughs> They talked about it being 150 billion, 160 billion dollars, uh, which we're borrowing. Uh, someone pointed out, uh, I think Judd Gregg, we're borrowing money from China, which our kids and grandkids will have to pay for with interest. So we're going to take that money and we're going to send it out checks to people so they can buy a flat screen TV made in China. <laughs> you wonder who's getting the benefit of this. Uh, and right now, our budget deficit our deficit this year I think now let me put it this way yeah our our total 
a deficit. This year will be somewhere in the neighborhood of about, I want to say, three or four hundred billion dollars total. Then the trade deficit's about seven hundred billion. It's pretty close to a trillion. I've had them both both up. Trade deficit plus the other deficit. It's just huge. Uh, it's about. Uh, uh, right now, our trade deficit plus our current accounts deficit is about 10% of our GDP, way beyond anything we ever imagined. Do you think that the Senate in the 1990s uh, would be handle, <coughs> handling things differently? Would have handled different things differently in the 1990s? <coughs> no, be handling them now. I'm sorry. Oh, here, get, get, get him. Some, get, get some How would that? I've lost it. Can you stop that? Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, get your water. Uh, yeah, I, I think that the Senate uh, of uh, uh, the 90s would have handled today's problems or, or, or fiscal problems differently. Um, but then again, uh, you have to think, you know, the White House is a player in this too. And I've been here through, what, five, six presidents now? from forward on, and uh, I've never seen anything like this in the White House, where it's just, I mean, they're just adamant. They're not going to raise any revenues whatsoever. But when your need sometimes needs, you, you've got to do some things. And even the most conservative Republicans in the past have recognized that once in a while you've got to do some things. We've got this position now with the White House saying this. Now, what I like to tend to think is if we had in the 90s with a Dole as a leader, uh, uh, he probably would have told the White House, well, that may be your position, but that's not going to carry here. we got to do some other things. Now, he would have been fiscally prudent about it, but he would have recognized sometimes you have to bend a little bit and do some things. But uh, what's happening now is that the White House says things and the Republican leadership just doesn't. They just follow the White House. And I've never seen this before around here. I suppose what's uh, lingering in their minds is read my lips and uh, the price that Republicans paid for that, both Bush in terms of re-election in 92 and Dole in 96. That was one of the things people were still holding against him. Uh, I know. They talk about that all the time. I don't think that had a had that much to do with it uh, at all. Um, uh, it was, if, if anything, it was a self-inflicted wound. In which I don't remember Democrats saying, oh, you broke your promises. No, I don't think that was, it was never a, that kind of a play. It was internal only to some Republicans. Uh, so I, I, don't, I don't think that had a, that much of a factor in it. I think a small core of the Republican Party used that uh, to try to say that that was the reason why. I don't think so at all. Uh, uh, either for Senator Dole or for for uh, 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 former President Bush. I just think it was the, the times, things were changing, uh, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, and I just think Senator Dole had a, kind of got a bad draw when he ran for president in 96 uh, uh, with the incumbent president. Uh, so there's a lot of factors in there. I don't think that was. I don't think that was a controlling factor. Just two more questions. Um, you <clears throat> mentioned your differences on farm policy with Dole. Just broadly speaking, um, sort of, how was your approach to farm policy different from from his? And did it have anything to do with Iowa versus Kansas or not? No, I don't think so. It didn't have much to do with Iowa versus Kansas. Uh, I think it uh, just had more to do with the philosophy of, of uh, farm policy at that time. Uh, I had something called the harkin Gephardt Farm Bill, which would have uh, perhaps been more government intervention, more government into the marketplace, substituting higher loan rates, target prices, uh, set-asides of land and stuff like that for controlling the supply. Uh, I think Senator Dole was more of a free market person um, and uh, you know, probably thought that uh, the minimalist approach of government in those things was probably better. There was a legitimate policy difference. Um, 
And usually, as so often happens, the truth is probably somewhere in between <laughs> both of those positions. How did uh, subsidies play into that? Did you agree on, on? Well, you know, Dole was very good on, on, on foreign policy, quite frankly. And as I look back, compared to what we're facing now, I would have been closer to Dole than I am to the opposite side today, quite frankly. Uh, I think that uh, the Dolman Govern Food Bill, for example, uh, Dole was always very good on nutrition programs. Dole was always there on nutrition, strongly. Um, and he was there, I mean, I look back and I think, what were we fighting about? I mean, <laughs> And perhaps this is also a temper that tells the time. Back in those days, we had these fights on farm policy over the edges. On the main thing in the middle, we agreed on. It was always sort of on the edges we were battling. Today, it's sort of on the fundamental premise of what we do in agriculture that we're fighting over. Uh, so I look back and I think, well, I, I didn't realize Dole and I agreed on so many, th so many things. It's interesting uh, with that historic look back on that. So that is a perfect segue to my last question, really, which is in 50 years, how do you think Dole will be looked back upon and how do you think he should be thought of in the future? In 50 years? Um, well, I think he'll be looked upon as one of the uh, a, a key figure in the in the uh, progress of America. Uh, he played a key role here in Congress for a long time. Uh, he was a candidate for president three times, four to three times, three times candidate for president. And uh, and uh, it was just a very key player here for all the years I was here when I first came here and for, through 96. Uh, so I think he'd be looked upon as someone who was uh, for a period of time, was one of the key pivotal players in American political politics. I think secondly, he'll be looked upon as someone who was a key player uh, in the development of disability policy and helping to get it done, to get it through. Uh, he was always in the background. He, never, he was never in the forefront because he wasn't on the committee and he was minority leader at that time. He had a lot of things. But he pulled together, as I said earlier, the key people to get it done. Um, and uh, I think if we look back upon as, 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 a, as, a, as a reasonable, uh, conservative, uh, who, uh, who I think had a a very a much broader view of America than maybe some of those who have come after him. I don't mean to cast stones at anyone, but I just think Dole had a much broader view. Um, I can remember standing on the Supreme Court steps with him one day after a, uh, uh, a hearing on the case, it was a case on the Americans with Disabilities Act. And after we came out, we were both shaking our heads at some of the statements made by the Supreme Court justices uh, and what they were saying and, and what we had done. And we couldn't believe that they were going off in the direction they were going on. There have been some decisions undermining the Americans with Disabilities Act, and both Dole and I have been active in trying to do it. And as we speak right now, we have an Americans with Disabilities Act Restoration Act, an ADA Restoration Act, to restore the ADA back to what we had it, what we intended. The Supreme Court has, has through several decisions, mostly five to four decisions, eroded what it, we intended to do in the ADA to, to, the, to the point now where I don't know if you want me to get into this, but, but we have a situation now where because of Supreme Court decisions, if you have a disability and you use an assistive device, glasses or hearing aids or, uh, or you take medicine for diabetes to control diabetes or something like that, if you do that, uh, 
you take that, and you have an assistive device, that could make you qualified for a job. But if you do, then you're not covered by the ADA. Which means that if you have a disability, and you take medicine to control it, that makes you qualified, you can get the job. But once you get the job, and if the employer finds out that you have diabetes, they you say, well, uh, they don't have to give you a reasonable accommodation, or they can fire you, and you have no recourse under the ADA because you use an assisted device. We specifically, in the ADA, in the, now, in the law, you know, you can't put every, every little thing in the law, so you have report language that tells you what we intended to do, and we said in the report language very explicitly that simply because you use an assisted device or take medicine to control or to help you get through a disability, in no way takes it away from the fact that you are disabled. The Supreme Court just ignored that. And Dole and I were over there. We're sitting in the front row listening to this. And we walked out and scratching our heads about this. And so now we have this ADA Restoration Act. And of course, you, as you might expect, Dole is in the forefront working with us to try to get this bill passed to get the Americans with Disabilities Act to where we had initially intended it to be. So I think uh, 50 years from now, uh, I think people look back and say, you know, even when he left the Senate, Dole was still fighting for some good things. Good. I know you're on a short string today, so we'll that's stop right. here. I hope Thank that's you. what you needed or wanted.